Game Boy conversions of home console franchises were often hit and miss. I think they were at their best when they went in a totally different direction and had the mechanics and ideas built from the ground up for this system. Like neither Mario Land feels like console Mario, and Metroid 2 was way chunkier and floatier than anything else in the series, but Zelda with Link's Awakening was just a full on flippin' Zelda. I mean it was weirder and more personal, but they somehow crammed the mechanics of A Link to the Past onto an 8-bit base, and while it had its limits, mostly the lack of buttons, you were changing items constantly, it was still great. Fantastic even. For some, it was their favourite game of all time. And while I don't think Link's Awakening quite gets there for me, I still fully respect everything it did for its time and adore playing through it today. It's a Game Boy classic, and the system and Zelda as a franchise would be infinitely less special without Link's Awakening. So what about Game Boy's other Zeldas? Yeah, other Zeldas. This is a sprawling series, and almost every game is someone's favourite. I can never quite decide mine, it's usually just the one that's the most fresh in my mind. Like when the last one I played is Wind Waker. Oh man, the sailing, the feeling of freedom, the charm, it's so good. But a link between worlds, taking the base of another masterful game, but with an original take on dungeon design and ingenious wall merging mechanic. Or Majora's Mask with its small scope, but the most at stake and everything feeling so close to you. I love them all, and I've never seen a game in the series that isn't someone's favourite. We're not talking about those ones. However, I think the ones I see get the least amount of love are these. Not because they're bad, people just don't really talk about them. Heck, many don't even know what they are. Like, why do they share the exact same space in so many top 20 lists? Why are you ranking them in the same place? They're not the same game. The Legend of Zelda Oracle of Ages and The Legend of Zelda Oracle of Seasons Released on the exact same day, on the exact same system, by the exact same developers, but far from the exact same games. They often get pulled into the same conversation as Pokemon and Yokai Watch being dual releases of the same game with minor changes, but that is so far from what they are. Yeah, they're both mechanically derived from Link's Awakening, but that's really where the similarities stop. The oracles have different stories, different characters, different overworlds, different towns, different dungeons, different core gimmicks. Throw just about any separation or bullet point out there and they'll tick them. It's like dragging Link's Awakening into the picture too as the same game because they share assets and play somewhat similarly. These are two games, not two halves of one. You can just play one of these without ever touching the other and have a complete experience. I mean, they definitely try and reel you in to get a more satisfying ending by playing both, but it's a little artificial to be honest. We'll get to that, but taken as a whole, these are as different as any other 2D game in the series. And so, this is actually one of two videos. I experienced both of these games a long time ago, but it has been a while, so coming in again was a pretty refreshing experience. But Derek is actually offering an entirely fresh perspective on Oracle of Seasons, which leaves us over here revisiting The Legend of Zelda Oracle of Ages. The Oracles weren't developed internally at Nintendo, but rather Capcom's flagship division. Yeah, Capcom. Not the first time Zelda left in-house production, but definitely a better instance of it that is the last CDI reference, I swear. Flagship would go on to also work on the Link to the Past GBA port with Four Swords, and more notably, another ground-up Zelda with Minish Cap. But if you've ever wondered why Nintendo don't let Capcom handle Zelda again, well, they kinda do. Flagship as a company were dissolved in 2007, with many staff floating back to other parts of Capcom. But even before they fell apart, the director of the Oracles, the Minish Cap and Four Swords, Hidemiro Fujibayashi, made his way permanently to Nintendo. So this became more than a simple collaboration with Capcom. Starting with the Oracles, this was the future of Zelda. Fujibayashi would go on to direct both Skyward Sword and more importantly, The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. This makes these two games the origin of one of the most important careers in this industry, so there is a lot to talk about. Fujibayashi originally just wanted to remake the first Legend of Zelda for Game Boy. He hoped that its possible success could lead to original productions down the line, but this soon got fast-tracked into a far more ambitious project. Fujibayashi and his team had to deliver both that concept and two other Zeldas, all releasing just a few months after the other. This would be known as the Triforce series, three games on the Game Boy Color. 
But as we all know, only two ever saw the light of day. Zelda 1 wouldn't get remade for Game Boy, but many elements of the original Zelda found their way into Oracle of Seasons. You'll see many boss designs, a focus on combat, and even some of its vagueness. Oracle of Ages, on the other hand, I'd argue is the more unique of the two, so let's get into why. Story isn't exactly a prominent aspect of the Oracles, but here's the gist. The same link from A Link to the Past has saved the world from Ganon, sailed off and discovered a dream world, and now remains back in Hyrule, where he's summoned by the Triforce itself. Upon arriving, he's either teleported to Holodrome if you're playing Oracle of Seasons, or Lebrinia in Oracle of Ages. The two happen in the order that you decide, so they aren't parallel worlds. The story picks up using a secret code upon finishing the game, so play in any order you want. There's no canon. Oracle of Ages, Oracle of Seasons, Oracle of Seasons, Oracle of Ages. You decide you are in control of your own destiny. Anyway, in Ages, Link wakes up stranded in a forest where he finds Impa being attacked. You manage to scare off the beasts, and she's fascinated with the triangle on your hand, leading you to a blocked path that can only be opened by the one bearing the mark. You of course do it, because I mean, there's nowhere else you can go, so you either do it or you turn the system off. Oh, you actually did it. Oh no. But if you don't do that, oh my god, it's Nehru! Oh, not the shiny goddess Nehru, the oracle Nehru. I guess it's a common name. This one sings nicely. But uh-oh, the possessed-looking Impa was actually possessed all along by the evil spirit Varan, who leaves Impa's body and takes Nehru instead, using her abilities of time to escape to the past and change the present. Oh no, not the children. And so it's up to you and her simp Ralph to go back in time and save Labrinia. Pretty simple stuff. Ralph doesn't really do anything, he just sometimes shows up and then runs away. Good old Ralph. Oracle of Ages can be quite a bit more character-driven than Seasons, but the story still isn't anything grand. Remember the Deku Tree from Ocarina of Time? Well, both Seasons and Ages have their own talking tree, but not only is the one in Ages actually a recurring character, but this one has a flower, and you agree to marry it. You agree to marry a tree. Is there fan art of Link in this tree? I'm very curious. The tree's obsessed with them. The queen in the past has gone a bit nuts and starts pushing all her citizens to build a huge structure called the Black Tower. This building gets higher and higher as the game goes on, and the gist is you go around the world, find the eight essences, defeat Varan at the top of the Black Tower, and save both the past and the present. It is very typical Zelda affair. Even if it does take place in a whole new land and without connecting the two, has zero appearance of Zelda. Of course, Link's Awakening was released in 1993, and while they colorified many of the sprites and assets in 98 for DX, they were still close to a decade between the two, and Zelda had moved on so much since then. I mean, these were the first Zeldas to follow the radical shift to 3D. Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask had so many new characters and races, but also new ideas of how you even design Zelda. Oracle of Ages does largely stick to its 2D influence, but it's fascinating to see what it takes from Ocarina. Heck, Minish Cat would come in and take the role! Oracle of Seasons tends to take characters from Ocarina of Time, like the Windmill Man right here, but Ages takes a lot from Majora's Mask. We've got the monkeys, Tingle, the Happy Mars Salesman, even the Hand! And we've got other races we've never seen in 2D until now, like Gorons and Friendly Zoras. Actually, this was the first game that really specified that Zoras had two different kind of factions. They were just kind of randomly friendly in Ocarina of Time. But in Oracle of Ages, you come across both them and the A Link to the Past variants. They coexist! The difference in hardware power too is clear, being a Game Boy Color exclusive this time. There's still plenty of just square screens in the overworld, but for dungeons, there's actually a ton of scrolling going on now, and that's huge! If you ever played Link's Awakening's Dungeon Builder on Switch, you probably felt the restrictions of working with these box templates, but that really doesn't apply to Oracle of Ages. There's actually very few square boxy rooms, and the more diverse real estate creates really organic feeling dungeons. And yeah, the use of color is fantastic. Everything feels so much more vivid and detailed than Link's Awakening DX, and they fully lean into it with color-based puzzles, and I suppose even the central gimmick of seasons. It'd be pretty hard to read the difference between spring and summer without a full range of color. The gimmick of ages, though, doesn't really rely so much on color, and maybe conceptually not as interesting. 
Basically, with the Harp of Ages, you can first ignite portals scattered around the world, and you can use those to go back in time. Then you learn another song that returns you to the present without a portal, and then you learn another song that lets you go back and forth between the two whenever you want. It's basically what Link to the Past did with the Dark World, right? Even the Mirror and Harp are the exact same items with the exact same function. You've got one world in the present, and another in the past, and you must use both to find a path through the other. It's not a new idea, and even making it about time travel isn't a new concept, as we just kinda did that in Ocarina, but it's a much more thorough use of the concept. You'll switch ages constantly in the overworld, right from the start of the game, and while they ease you into it at first, it gets so much more use than Link's the Past ever tried with the Dark World. Being essentially the same world at different points of time, the characters are somewhat entwined. Their fates are, at least. Like with the Zoras, Veran has poisoned the ocean, so while the king is alive in the past, he actually dies in the future. So unless you find a way to stop the pollution before it can kill him, there's no way to find a way forward in the present. Or in the Goron Mines, the terrain changes so significantly from their tunnels and building that just going between times is a pretty substantial puzzle in itself. The majority of present characters are not alive in the past, so you've got a whole new array of NPCs with unique items and quests, and it's fascinating to figure out how you can merge those with a completely different time period and cast of characters. In the past, one guy says his aim is to develop flippers to swim in the water before he dies, so while there's no sign of them in the past, you can find his grave in the present, so come on everyone, let's go grave robbing! Wahoo! Grab your shovel, viewers! Seasons definitely is more fresh, but I don't know if it's better. Yeah, we've done all this world traveling before, but never to this extent. I think Aegis deserves a lot more respect for his gimmick, even if it is technically the third time Zelda has touched this concept. Heck, in Seasons, it's only ever overworld puzzles, but Aegis actually gets a little clever in dungeons. It's never actually done within the dungeon itself, but they take what they did in Ocarina of Time Spirit Temple and do it way better in Oracle of Ages. The dungeon itself never gives you a drastic hint about what to do, but I did find it suspicious that I picked up both an old mermaid key, and then later found just a standard mermaid key to enter the temple. It was pretty clear that both times were involved somehow, and it comes together in such a clever and natural way. And that's the thing, neither oracle games help you very much. You can go back and talk to the tree, and they'll point you in a certain direction, but apart from that, that's all you're getting. Seasons can probably get too obscure at times, maybe in line with the Zelda 1 inspirations, but Ages, I think, finds a brilliant balance. I hate how some games just force-feed you answers. The worst thing in an adventure game is when you feel like you know the solution already, but then an NPC is like, oh, here's the solution, no, let me do! All Oracle of Ages will do is tell you there's a feeling of something in a particular part of the world, like head east, head west, head north. The overworld actually moves in rather linear chunks, you don't really revisit areas very often, but progression through these areas then becomes the puzzle itself. Skyward Sword did this quite often too, where the open world feels more like an extension of dungeon design. And in the overworld of ages, you'll be solving mazes, finding an abstract way to reach characters, of course using both time periods, and in one instance, even having your entire inventory stripped away from you, and having to work with minimum resources to get everything back. Hey! Fujibayashi did that again, too! And there! Sneaky Fujibayashi! There were plenty of moments where solutions didn't come to me, and a couple were pretty specific, but I think Ages balances its difficulty and obscurity far better than Seasons does. These two can sometimes toe the line of that old PC adventure game feel, especially with their trading quests, but at least here in Ages, I think they nailed a pretty great flow. There's a couple of times where it shifts its pacing too, if only for a few short bursts. Both games have these animal buddies, kinda like Kirby's Dream Land 2, another Game Boy game, and while you can optionally get flutes that summon them whenever you want, their mandatory segments are mere minutes long. Really underutilized actually, as they're pretty damn cool. Link hopping around in a kangaroo pouch, or riding atop a bear with wings. They're awesome, but they're not really explored here, and the Zelda series hasn't really ever touched this concept again. But knowing my boy Fujibayashi, he's plotting to bring it back. That man's always plotting. You've also got stuff like the Goron Rhythm game, that's surprisingly demanding, I've failed this so many times. Then you've got holding off swarms of hard hats while this minecart goes around and you make sure it doesn't crash while standing on this button, but they're pushing you off it. 
There's also a shooting gallery. Oh, and this is one mini game where you throw meat at the Toke, but sometimes they are too fast and I couldn't reach them in time. Just take my meat, Toke! Eventually they just kind of spawn nicely and I could distribute it fairly, but the majority of the time, too fast for my meat. One thing the Oracle games are fantastic at is using your rubies. There's a ring system in the game that you can ignore if you want, but a bunch of rings are scattered around the world, and if you equip them, you get specific benefits like dealing more damage, having more health, get more item drops, and so on. But even if you find these rings, you need to appraise them, which costs rupees. There's always something to spend your money on, which is usually one of the bigger problems in Zelda games. Like, major side quests often culminate in, ah, here's a larger wallet, and you're like, game, the last thing I need is more rupees. Whereas Oracle of Ages both incentivizes exploration and uses those resources properly. It's done really well. But where things get stretched perhaps a bit thin is in the dungeons, and more specifically, the items. Both Oracle of Ages and Oracle of Seasons have 8 dungeons each, so Capcom made 16 in the span of around a year, and I dread to think about what a third game would have done to them. They are usually quite good, but in terms of themes and item usage, they do blend together a bit. The first one's just kind of a generic dungeon, so you go in and you get the power bracelet, which isn't exactly an exciting item. On one hand, they've improved upon Link's Awakening by not giving you a novel of text when you bump into a bottle without one equipped, but on the other hand, you still need to keep equipping it over and over and over again to pick anything up. The second dungeon is more interesting. We've got Rock's Featherback, one of the cooler items, and a brand new gimmick with these minecarts. Something else that returned in Skyward Sword and Breath of the Wild, Fujibayashi can't be stopped! They're in Minish Cap too! The problem is generally clear, I think, though. Ocarina and Majora went a long way to making dungeons feel like contextually established places in the world, especially the first three in Ocarina, but these are almost all just dungeons. Color adds some diversity at least, and there are some good ideas, like one where you open up a central entrance by finding four slates in a non-linear order, or one that takes place almost entirely underwater and you swim around like a mermaid. And by the way, this one brings back managing water levels like Ocarina of Time, but I think the 2D perspective really helps make this much more digestible. It's actually a pretty great dungeon. Although, to swim, you keep tapping the direction to move forward rather than just holding it or pressing a button, and that starts to murder your thumb after a bit. There are some cool new ideas, but it also likes reusing stuff a lot. I hope you like standing over tiles to make them the same color. There's two variants of this puzzle, and they do them in what feels like most dungeons. There's also this block flipping puzzle where you make it land on a specific side. They were very proud of this, and it kept coming back. And these rotating doors that make you go in a specific direction depending on how you enter the door. That kept coming back too. For all the good and unique stuff these dungeons do, they're clogged down by the equally generic and reused elements. They can be good, some really good, but making 16 dungeons was clearly a huge ask. No single Zelda game has that many dungeons. Reaching 8 in 1 is a rare accomplishment. We often call Majora's Mask's development a miracle, but I think these pair might even be more impressive in terms of just raw planning. And yeah, the items. Ages and Seasons don't share a direct pull, but both pretty much bring the mainstays back from Link's Awakening, and plus a few unique ones each. You've got stuff like the bombs, the boomerang, rock's feather, your sword and shield, but kind of a new one is the cane of Samaria from A Link to the Past. Just summons a block, and you can push the block. This isn't really new. But also kinda new is the switch hook, and this is a hook shot, but a little bit different, and actually pretty flippin' cool. It still grapples onto things, but rather than making you go towards it, you switch positions with the item. It actually has fantastic puzzle-solving capabilities. Would love to see this come back for future games. It's a great item, but it's only ever appeared in Oracle of Ages. It's still not exactly a completely unique one, but it's cool. What's kind of deflating is a lot of the dungeons start iterating upon existing items. So like the switch hook becomes the long hook, which yeah, Ocarina of Time did that as well, but the power bracelet becomes the power glove, taking an already pretty boring item and making another dungeon around it. This time it picks up big statues, and that's not even a puzzle. It's just you can pick up bigger objects rather than smaller ones now. Nothing changes. Seasons isn't overflowing with unique items either, but at least I had a brand new idea with Magnetic Glove. That's a really cool item, even if the sound effect is terrible. 
Yeah. Actually, to be honest, a lot of the sound isn't great. Some bits are reused from Link's Awakening, and they're fine. I like the town themes quite a lot, but almost everything else has a really repetitive short loop, and some dungeon themes. I mean... Yeah. I do like how they've condensed some items, though. Magic Powder from Link's Awakening now has a few variants in seeds, and one of these replaces the Pegasus Boots with a temporary speed boost. No more stopping to rev up, you're just always moving like you've got the Pegasus Boots on. It's awesome! You also have Fire Seeds replacing a Lantern, Gale replacing a Fast Travel item, and then Scent and Mystery which have far less use. Mystery mostly gets owl statues to give you hints, and it also damages this guy. I'll let you know that now because it took me far too long to figure this out. And then there's Scent, which I treated as ammo because you also get a seed launcher later. Scent can distract enemies, but it's rarely actually used for puzzles. It's way better for shooting stuff. Variety of dungeons and items I think show where the dual release concept suffered most. It's still good. They get a lot of mileage out of the ideas they have and continue to build further upon Link's Awakening's ideas. But things do blur together, especially if you play them back to back. Bosses are at least more of a highlight. Plasmarine is easy, but it's cool getting it to launch its projectiles back at itself using the switch hook. And Shadow Hag is like a boo that you can't look at. You gotta rebound your seeds on the walls to make them smack the hag. Then there's Smog, which is like a flipping block puzzle game. What Age's bosses are great at is extending the idea of puzzles into combat. There are some that fall flatter, mostly the mini bosses that you just kinda whack with your sword. And this guy's just the Nintendo floating hand boss that we've seen many times before. But when it's good, it's really good. So, disjointed in areas, yeah. But I still love being swept on the island with the weird Toke, who are a species I really want to see return in Zelda. And I love how divided Zora's domain felt from the rest of the world, truly feeling like a hidden little cavern. When in the overworld and jumping back and forth between times, Oracle of Ages can be so charming and clever. Exploring the seas long before Wind Waker, or finding a town where everything is in symmetry, even the NPCs. There's a lot of stuff Zelda had never done before, and a lot of stuff that even today has not been done again. And then there's a lot of reused ocarina ideas like sneaking past guards in the castle, or climbing a stone wall while boulders fall from the sky. Yeah, the gaps in development show, but there's still such a brilliant game under here. Link manages to detach Veram from the body of Nehru, but then she floats directly into the Queen, taking even more power over the land, and uh-oh, the Black Tower is complete. However, with the eight essences picked up from around the world, we can storm the tower, confront Veran one last time, and save the world. Oh, but wait, before you do that, Nehru and Impa are like, Oh, Link, we forgot to say, but the simpy boy Ralph, who you've encountered a few times over the game, he's actually a direct descendant of the Queen, and if you kill her, he'll die too. What? Where the heck did that come from? So now Link has an incentive not to spill royal blood. Ah, so guess we've got to rip the spirit out and damage it outside the queen. I wanted treason! Where is my treason? Once you whack the spirit a few times, Varan gives up and turns into a new form. A big old imp fairy thing. There's not much to this outside of hitting them a few times when they're close, but there's also four shadow links up against you, and they also don't pose much of a challenge, but they do drop a lot of health. So thanks for that, Varan. You've just given us health. It's pretty simple stuff, but there's one more phase, which is Veran's true form. A turtle. Veran morphs between three animals. There's a turtle, a bee, and a spider. It's handy to use the Pegasus seeds to dodge their attacks, and then throw in some hits when they're close. Not too tough. And I guess that is the Legend of Zelda, Oracle of Ages. Defeating Veran means the present can return to normal, with the Queen and Nehru free, and everything begins to return. The tree gets a Link statue they can stare at all day, and things are mostly tied together in a satisfying way. Mostly. See, right before storming Black Tower, Link gets confronted by Twin Rover. Yeah, the witch is from Ocarina of Time, and as of now, it's a completely loose plot thread. You get one final tease as the credits roll, and it pushes you to follow through in the Legend of Zelda Oracle of Seasons. I'd say, disregarding this, Ages wraps up most of its self-contained story very well. But this new narrative of the two being an intertwined experience is kind of forced. It's just thrown in right at the end of the game. So that begs the question, how impactful is it to link them? Not that impactful. Starting seasons with this code maintain Link's name, which was John for me, and let me start with four hearts instead of three. Neat! 
This season's playthrough would differ somewhat to the fresh one Derek had. Some characters acknowledge that this Link had already been on a journey to Labrinia, but the beats are almost identical to the base seasons. Right after saving the world, Link is teleported straight to Holodrome, and from there is the same story of Din being captured by Onox, and so on. Some characters from ages have also come to Holodrome, like the Queen, which is pretty cool, but it's not like a whole new game. It's awesome that there's a base version of Seasons and a base version of Ages, and then also kind of an altered version as well, but it's not like you're missing out if you don't see every instance of both versions. They definitely up the replay value, as some NPCs now drop codes that can be used in the other game, and that's cool. Kind of captures the secrets of the original NES Zelda in a much tighter and neat bubble. You can also now get the Master Sword by doing the trading sequence rather than just the Noble Sword. That's rad! But the biggest impact of playing Seasons connected to Ages though is of course, the Climax. But it honestly comes across as a little generic, when both Seasons and Ages have such unique settings and elements, but Zelda now appears a couple of times over the story, and by the end she's captured by Twin Rover to resurrect Ganon. It reminded me a lot of Twilight Princess, how the majority of the game had Zant as this major villain, but then all of a sudden, nah, he's just a puppet to Ganon. But even here, Ganon doesn't really have any connection to the characters of Oracles. It's just Twin Rover wanting him to come back, so here he is. You take on Twin Rover in pretty much the same way as Ocarina of Time, by firing the opposite colour projectile at the other, and then the next phase is mostly as simple as whacking them with your sword and mystery seeds. But as they die, they sacrifice their bodies to bring back the Pigman. He was nothing but a shadow in Link's Awakening, but in the Oracles, he's got his full form back. It's also no longer a carbon copy of Link to the Past, there's actually some unique moves going on here. But if you've got the Master Sword and the Red Ring which doubles your damage, he'll go down in like… <laughs> a few seconds. And that is what you get for connecting both games. Like 5 minutes of additional boss battles and some new pixel art to the base game to end off. So is it worth linking the games? I mean, if you're gonna play both the games anyway, then yeah. But I've definitely heard people say, oh you haven't played the full oracles if you haven't linked them together, and honestly, I don't agree. Oracle of Ages stands on its own just fine, and so does Seasons. The linked ending is for sure a loose plot thread if you don't do it, but it's one that's pretty cheaply thrown in anyway, so does it deserve to be done? Again, if you're playing both anyway, yeah, but if you're not, I wouldn't say so. But regardless of how I feel about that, Oracle of Ages is a spectacular game, and if, like seemingly many fans, you've gone all these years without giving it a go, do it now. Both of these are fully legitimate, standalone, mainline games, and yeah, there are some bumps from what seem like a very tight development, but there's also so much imagination and charm. It's not like Pokemon with two takes on the exact same game. This was a radical idea, and I don't think any developer in the modern landscape would try to pull this off today. And of course, it led the career path for one of gaming's most influential players, the origin of Hidemaru Fujibayashi's Zelda, and a damn good game. This video is to be continued in Oracle of Seasons.